Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come before thy throne of grace this morning. We come, Father, giving you all honor, praise, and the glory. Father, we know that you are truly worthy of our lot praises. And we ask that you would help us to always be prayerful for the love that you have for us. Father, let us be mindful how rich your grace is. You allowed us to see another day of life, allowing us this time to come together to praise you, to worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth. As we worship you this morning, Father, we pray that our country and the leaders that leads us We pray for them diligently, Father. Our country, Father, is in peril, and we do need your healing. It suffers the ills that only you can correct, Father. You can smooth our path. You can calm the storms to keep us safe. And we pray for that. Help us, Father, that we might see the beauty of life that you plan for each and every one of us. Strengthen our efforts to seek you in all things. We ask that you would be with us this morning as we give ourselves completely to thy word. Be with our brother Liddell as he bring us your message. Give him a ready recollection of those things you will have him say, Father. We ask continually blessings upon the East Alameda Church. Let it be strengthened according to your word. We ask that you would be with this sick and the afflicted among us. Keep us all safe as we go through this pandemic. Strengthen and comfort those that have lost loved ones. There have been so many. We just thank you, Father, for the kindness of your love for us all. And we pray that your word will help our faith grow even stronger in your son, Christ Jesus. Continue to bless us, Father, as we live for thee, as we long to be with you, Father. Help us as you, your spiritual family, that we might go forward doing those things that is always pleasing to you. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning. Let's sing song number one. That was song number one. And if it's not a burden to you, let's stand as we sing this song.
Please be seated. Our next song will be song number 268. That was 268. Do me. Our next song will be song number 322. 322, and during the song we will prepare for communion.
We have now come to the part of the service in which we remember our Lord and Savior. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, and I'll begin reading at verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. This is giving us as Christians scriptural example of when we partake of the precious body and blood of the Lord. Now, if you would, please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll begin reading from verse 23. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the same night in which he was betrayed took, took the cup, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we thank you for another wonderful Lord's day. As we humbly approach you, dear Lord, I pray that as we prepare to partake of this precious body, dear Lord, we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you, dear Lord. We thank you for your son who died on the cross, dear Lord, for each and every one of us and the forgiveness for our sins, dear Lord. Please be with us as we we partake of this precious body. In Jesus Christ's name, I say this prayer. Amen. Continuing verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eat and drinketh unworthily, eat and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home that ye come together not to condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for another wonderful day, dear Lord. We thank you for an opportunity to worship you, dear Lord, and also give thanks. Dear Lord, as we prepare to partake of this blood, dear Lord, I pray we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus Christ's name, I say this prayer. Amen.
Let's sing song number 106. 106. This has concluded the Lord's Supper. We are now to the portion of the service, which is giving. If you would, please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and I'll be reading verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let us pray. Dear Father, wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity to be here to fellowship and worship you, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us the right mind and right spirit, dear Lord. We thank you for allowing us to wake up today, dear Lord. Dear Lord, I pray each and every one of us has spoken with you this morning, dear Lord. We've prayed to you, dear Lord, and we've prepared ourselves, dear Lord, mentally to worship you. Dear Lord, I pray that as we prepare to give a portion of what we've made, dear Lord, I pray that each and every one of us do so, dear Lord, without a grudging heart. We also do so and do so in according to your will. Please continue to bless this church, dear Lord. Continue to bless this congregation. In Jesus Christ's name, I say this prayer. Amen. As they're finishing the collection, if you would like to mark the song that will be after our lesson, that will be song number 853. That was 853. And then the song before our lesson will be song number 627. That's 627, and again, if, you, if it's not a burden to you, let's stand as we sing.
Please be seated. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This morning, we will consider God's Word in application to an important subject in our lives, the subject of family. In particular, we will think about the topic of husbands and wives as winning teams. We want to think about the husband and wife relationship as a team and as a winning team as we follow God's will in our marriage relationship. I want my marriage to be a winning team. I like winning teams, don't you? I like to pull for winning teams, and so by the grace of God, I was born into a family of Alabama Crimson Tide fans, Brother Nurai. And hopefully tomorrow night, we will shout Roll Tide as they win the college football championship. We'll see what happens. I like to pull for the winning team. And you know, I like to be on the winning team. On a few scattered occasions in my life, I've had the opportunity to be on the winning team. What a joy when we played in a tournament and we won that tournament first place. We held up the prize. We have won. And I think in all of that, we realized that we had accomplished something as a team. We had succeeded as a team. We had achieved something which separately we could not have achieved. So we understand the idea of team and its importance, and we understand the joy and the importance of the idea of a winning team. Now, when we look into Scripture, we will see that the Bible describes the marriage relationship of husband and wife as a team, and that in essence, God describes it as a winning team. He tells us how we as husbands and wives in our marriages can be a winning team. When we think about being a team as husband and wife, we might ask the question, what is a team? And Webster says that a team is two or more people working together. A team is two or more people working together. Now, as we think about the word team, we probably think about a football team or a baseball team or a basketball team. We think of a group of people working together to accomplish something. But probably a better example of a team in terms of husband and wife would be the example of two oxen yoked together pulling in the same direction uh, to succeed in plowing a field, for example. The English word team comes from the old German word Psalm, which means to bridle or to yoke together. Now, when we think about the Bible description of a marriage, really the Bible describes the husband and wife as being joined together with a bridle or a yoke or as being yoked together. So, Brother Jameer just read for us Genesis 2, verse 24, in which we read, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be what? Joined to his wife. Paul warns, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There, the idea of a yoking together, while that could certainly apply to other kinds of relationships, surely it applies to the marriage relationship as well. So marriage is described as two people being yoked together. Thus, it is described in this way of a team. This morning, then, we want to think about husband and wife being a team. And we want to find some Bible principles that help us think about ourselves as a team, that encourage us as husbands and wives to remember that per God's plan, we are a team working together in this life. Hopefully, this encouragement from Scripture will help us be a winning team in our marriages. 
So let's notice this point first. A first condition for a team is met in God's design for marriage. That is, a marriage is the union of two people, one man and one woman. Let me say that again in 2021. A marriage is the union of two people, one man and one woman. Genesis 2, 18 through 24 demonstrates this for us. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn there and read along with me. Genesis 2, verses 18 through 24. There the text says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Marriage was instituted by God at the beginning. God defines the institution of marriage, and he defines it as the joining together of one man and one woman. I regret that we have to be this technical, but what that means is one male and one female. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 indicate this to us. As God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He, the text goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So when we speak of a marriage, we are speaking of the joining together of one man and one woman, of one male and of one female. That is what a marriage is. God defines the term, and that is how he defines it. Now, we might use that term to describe any number of other kinds of unions, but unless it is the union of one man and one woman, it is not a marriage according to the word of God. But a marriage is just that. It is the union of one man and one woman. In creating... God saw a need. He saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Man needed a companion. So God created for him a suitable helper whom the Bible calls the woman. Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 9, For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but the woman for man's sake. Man needed a helper. And God created for him a helper suitable a help meet, as it were, that is the woman. And so notice then that we have the first condition necessary for a team in marriage. We have two or more people, but specifically in this case, we have two people, a man and a woman. So it is clearly God's design that they are to be a team together, a man and a woman. But let's notice further the second point. A second condition of a team is satisfied in marriage as well, and that is that the husband and wife are joined together, or they are yoked together. Notice again, Genesis 2, verse 24, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus would later say, Matthew 19, 5, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul would later say, Ephesians 5, verse 31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so reiterated over and over four times in Scripture, in fact, is this statement that husband and wife are joined together in marriage. Genesis 2.24, the Hebrew translated joined together, is the word dabak. It can be translated as to cling to, to hold fast to, to stay close to, to stick together, or 
to be stuck together. And so, as we think about the husband and wife being joined together, they are made close to one another. They are stuck together in life. Now, yesterday, uh, at the funeral, we were having to usher people to their seats, and so Michael and Christine Selvage came in. We were very happy to see them and to have them in attendance. And I ushered them down the aisle here to the family, and I said, now, after you visit with the family, we'll need you to take an available seat on the side of the auditorium together. And if you will, please scoot all the way into the end of the pew. And if you don't mind, sit close together. And you know, they didn't mind at all sitting close together. That's how it ought to be with husband and wife. We are close together because we are joined together in the union of matrimony. Now, I know sometimes in marriage we feel more like we're stuck than we're sticking together. But the design of God for marriage is that we be joined together in such a way that we are sticking together. Think about the image of the yoke that bridles two oxen or two horses. They are yoked together in that cause of pulling that plow. And so, Husbands in the bond, husbands and wives rather, in the bond of marriage are yoked together by God. This can be a sweet blessing. Think of the yoking of the disciple to the teacher in our relationship to Christ. That's a sweet blessing, isn't it? Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. There are times when it can be easy to be yoked together. And that's what God would hope for our marriages as he joins us together. There can be times when it can be difficult to be yoked together. You imagine if you yoked an oxen and a goat together. Would that be an easy yoking? Brother Herschel, would you want to get behind that plow and try to man that team? Skin that ox and that goat, I don't think you'd want to. Sometimes being yoked together can be a very difficult thing if we are, as the Bible describes, unequally yoked, and that's the image. (laughs) Put two different kinds of animals together, they don't want to cooperate, they don't want to pull together, they're not going in the same direction. But the husband-wife team, as God designs it, as he plans it, as he wills for it to be, and as he teaches us in Scripture that it should be as an equal yoking where we are joined together. Now, the Bible says of this being joined together that we become one flesh. We noticed four passages that describe for us the fact that we become one flesh. This describes a kind of cohesive character of our team. We are together functioning as one body should function. Now, when everything goes right, if my brain decides that it wants to lift its hand up, the hand will go up, right? That's normally how a body works if it's functioning cohesively. Does your body always work that way? All right, sometimes my mind says, I'm going to say it like this, and then Mandy will say, I don't, did you hear what you said? You said... You use this word, I think you meant this. Doesn't come out of my mouth like it should. Y'all have heard that before. But when the body is working correctly, all of the parts function together for whatever the common purpose of that body is. Paul said there are many members, but one body, Romans 12 verse 20, in description of the church. that There are all these different members, but we work together as one body in the cause of Christ. So similarly, there are two members of the marriage union. There is husband and wife, but those two members come together as one flesh. Now, as two members, those two members have different roles, and the Bible describes this for us. The husband is to be the head of the household. We might say that he is to be the captain of the team. Ephesians 5 verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. So the husband has a role as one member of this team. The wife also has a role as a member of this team. Ephesians 5 verse 22 beginning says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So notice then that there are distinct and different roles given to husband and wife as the two members of the team. But notice this. They twain, or they too, shall become one flesh. Here's an important point that needs to be made concerning marriage. Marriage is not two roommates living together and splitting the bills. That is not what marriage is. Marriage is not two people who live wholly different lives from one another, and who come together as they can when their schedules permit or where their interests might overlap. That is not what marriage is. Marriage is two people who are willing to make sacrifices of themselves in order to become one flesh. While they remain two distinct people, they are mature enough to accept that they may have to sacrifice some things from their lives when they were single, separate, and individual, so that they may come together as a team and function as one flesh. Now, you watch a team where there is a star player who doesn't want to be a team player, and you tell me how well that team will succeed. Yesterday, I was pulling for the Seattle Seahawks. I don't know if anybody else was, but I like Russell Wilson, and I don't like the Rams. And so I wanted the Seahawks to win. And on the Seahawks team, there is an all-star receiver named D.K. Metcalf. He's an excellent receiver, but he's been frustrated because as such a good receiver, he's getting double and triple teamed. So he can't get open, and Russell Wilson can't get passes to him. And so the offense is stymied. And if you go and look, you'll see that they lost Well, the commentator said that D.K. Metcalf has had to learn, hey, if I'm covered, then I've got to run blocks. I've got to block for the people who can get open. And in his second year in the NFL, thinking that he would have been a star receiver and being frustrated at the treatment he's receiving, he said, it's hard for me to think about playing that role on the team. Marriage is going to present to us certain roles that we have to play on the team that will require of us making sacrifices, kinds of sacrifices that we might not have expected or envisioned, but if we want the team to succeed, then we will be team players. And we will make sacrifices of ourselves so that that team can function cohesively and succeed. So there's this second point. Marriage is two people who are joined together. And here is this third point as we conclude our study of marriage as a team in light of scripture. And that is that these two people are yoked together and pulling in a common cause. These two people are yoked together and they are pulling in a common cause. It's clear that God gave us marriage so that Uh, we could accomplish certain purposes for which he has designed us. Why did God create marriage? Because when he created man, he saw that it was not good for man to be alone, Genesis 2, 18. That is, there were purposes for man which God had which could not be accomplished if man was alone in this life. And so God created something for man so that he could accomplish those purposes. And what did he create? Well, he created woman and he created the institution of marriage. So just as two oxen or two horses are yoked together, not just for the fun of getting out that yoke and putting it on the team, 
But because there's a purpose for their yoking, they've got to go out and plow that field. That hard earth needs to be dug up so that it can be sown or planted. So there's a purpose for the yoking of marriage. God yokes us together in marriage as husband and wife so that we will accomplish the purposes for which he created us in this world. God has a design for marriage that we as a team will work together in common cause and for common purposes. So what are some of those common purposes for which we are yoked together in the bond of marriage? Well, among them would simply be that we have a happy and successful life. God wants us to have happy lives, successful lives. He wants us to enjoy the blessings of life. In Psalm 34, 12 through 14, and in 1 Peter 3, 10, the question is asked, who would desire to love life and see good days? Well, I want to love life, don't you? I want to see good days. God created me with that purpose upon this earth, that I should love life and see good days. And so those texts will go on to give us instruction about how to love life and see good days. Within God's plan for loving life and seeing good days is that we should enjoy this bond of matrimony by which life will be enriched, by which life will be abundantly blessed. There is a success equation in the United States of America. I don't know if it holds true in other capitalist democracies, but it holds true in the United States of America. It's a four-step success equation. It's said that, that the overwhelming majority of those who will take these four steps and in this order will rise comfortably into the middle class of society. Here are the four steps. Graduate high school, number one. Number two, get a job. Number three, get married. And number four, have children. That is the four-step success equation. The majority of those who do those four steps in that order rise comfortably into the middle class of American society. Notice that the third step is marriage. Marriage is a part of the average success of Americans. When they marry, they have greater resources, they have greater strength, and they have greater success in their lives. This is God's plan and his wisdom manifesting itself in our culture in America. God has a design for marriage that our lives should be more abundant and more successful because we enter according to his will into this relationship. But also, God has within marriage and in the marriage team the design that we should know their intimate companionship. Intimate companionship. Every one of us has a longing in our hearts to be known intimately by someone and to be loved by them even as they know us intimately. Isn't that right? Someone who knows everything about us and they love us anyway. They love us just like we are. What a beautiful thought. And that is the intimate companionship which God has designed to be at the heart of marriage. When the Bible describes the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31, it says of the husband that he trusts her. Proverbs 31 verse 11. It says of the husband that he has done good by her. Proverbs 31 28 says of the husband that he praises her, Proverbs 31, verse 12. So there is this beautiful and intimate companionship found only in marriage as designed by God to bring joy and fulfillment to our hearts and our lives. God has a design for this team, which is that together as husband and wife, they can know the joy and the fulfillment of parenthood. They can know the joy and the fulfillment of parenthood. Did you notice, as I gave you those four steps of the success equation, graduate from high school, get a job, that the third step was get married, and then the fourth step was have children? You know, as I, I, was, I was, was a child, we had a rhyme. First comes love, then comes marriage. Uh, and then comes the baby carriage. And so here is God's design for marriage, that we should be together, joined together, two as one flesh, and then that those two should be fruitful and multiply 
and replenish the earth, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. That they should be fathers and mothers, rearing children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. That they should know the blessing of an inheritance from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward from God, Psalm 127, 3. Here is a wonderful cause and blessing of the marriage relationship as designed by God. Someone asked me recently, why do we have children? Have you ever thought about that one? Maybe you've had a couple days where you've said, now why? What was the, what was the rationale here? And I said to that person, I remember as a teenager asking my grandmother that, my mother's mother. She had two children who grew to adulthood. She had several miscarriages. She had children who died as they had lived many years in this life or died in infancy. It was a hard life for her being a mother. And yet she was so joyful to have those two daughters that she was able to raise to adulthood. And I remember thinking about all those hardships that she had in that parenting process and asking her, Meemaw, why do people have children? She said, because it fulfills you because it fulfills you. And perhaps there are many, many more things that we could say, but God has made us such that it gives us great joy and fulfillment to bring children into this world. And I believe to have the opportunity to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to raise them to be the disciples of Christ and the children of God, and to continue to do the work of Christianity in this world well beyond our lives, a design for the home as a team, as we work together, God has given us the common cause of bringing children into this world and parenting them together. We should be together as a team, as parents in our homes. But finally, God has given us the cause of serving him faithfully in this life and winning the prize of a home in heaven. God has given us that cause. And more than any other thing in this world, the husband and wife relationship ought to help us serve God faithfully. As husbands and wives, we ought to be helping each other get closer to God and closer to our home in heaven one day. We are made to serve and worship God, Revelation 4.11. It is our purpose in life to fear God and to keep his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. As husband and wife, we help one another do that most important thing, fulfill that most important purpose, loving and serving God in this life so that one day we will have a home in heaven with him. When we think about a team, a team has a goal. A team has a way in which they can win and they want to win. Football teams, they they want to win the championship. Well, the marriage team wants to win, too. As husband and wife, we want to win the prize of the crown of life, which is laid up for the faithful, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. And it should be our goal in every day as a team, as husband and wife, to love each other and help each other to fear God and to serve him faithfully, to help each other toward winning that prize of a home in heaven and a crown of life. I want to encourage you, if you're a husband or a wife, to remember that you're a team. Remember that you're a team. Next time you have a fight together, you'll probably have a fight together. Next time you have a fight together, remember, hey, we're a team. We're not rivals. We're not adversaries. We're a team. God has taken this man and this woman and joined them together and given us a common cause of living life together, loving each other, and looking for a home in heaven together one day. I think if we'll think of ourselves as a team formed by God with the cause and purpose of going to heaven together, then that will help us so much in our homes and give us so much happiness in our marriages. Well, if you are a husband or wife, I hope that you are that faithful Christian in your marriage that you should be, that God has designed you to be. Every marriage will be stronger if every husband and wife is a faithful Christian. That's where it starts. Maybe that uh, 
you aren't a faithful Christian now, but you would like to become one, we would love to help you make that decision. You can become a Christian today by believing in Jesus as the Christ, turning from your sins in penitence, confessing the name of Christ and being immersed in water for the remission of sins. If you are ready to make that decision, we are ready to help you with that decision. Maybe that you need to come back to Christ, turning from sin and seeking forgiveness through prayer. Whatever your need might be, we pray that you'll make it known now as we stand and as we sing. When we walk with the Lord. Our final song this morning will be song number 503. 503, after this, we'll be led in prayer. Sorry, that seems a bit low. No, that's right. I don't know.
Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be with each other this morning, to uh, sit with each other, to talk with each other, to worship you, and we thank you for the sermon this morning. We thank you, Father, for your word. Not only does it guide us on marriage, but it teaches us how to love and how to have hope. And we thank you, Father, for the hope that we have in Christ, that uh, he took away the, the devastation and the scary portion of the grave. By being raised from the dead, Father, he gave all of us the hope that we all need. And we thank you, Father, for your word that we all have the ability to guide the people, to guide ourselves, but people that we love, Father, that if we truly believe and hold to the faith, that we can bring them to Christ. And what better joy can there be to know that the people that we love, Father, will one day be with you. There has been a lot of bereavement, Father, recently and grief. We've lost people that we've loved. We have uh, have members of this congregation who have friends and family members that are dear to them, that are ill, and that have passed on. Father, sometimes we don't understand everything that happens, but Father, it is our prayer that we can be faithful and look to your word for the guidance that we need to be successful, to succeed, and press on to that goal, which is heaven. We thank you for all the members here, Father, and all the many works that are done here in this congregation. We further pray, Father, for this country, for its success. We know, Father, that there's going to be uh, new people in office. And with that, Father, as in all administrations of government throughout the city, the state, the world, we pray, Father, that, that the decisions that are made are in accordance to your will. And we pray, Father, that godly men and godly women will be our elected officials. Go with us this week, Father. Allow us to have the peace that comes from you and through you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.